Thank you, Dr. Wheeler, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be with you. I've heard about your work for years. Uh, matter of fact, I knew Dale Larson years ago down in Tucson when he was down there, I guess after he was president here at some point. Is that correct? Uh, anyway, of course, you don't know when I was in Tucson, so I guess that would make a difference. It's good to be with you. Dr. Wheeler has asked me to talk about the question of why I do archaeology, and, uh, and so I'll discuss that for a few moments this morning. First, I want to talk about the fact that I do not do it because of uh, the wealth that is developed and that we find. Um, Indiana Jones, of course, always goes around and there's always some grand thing that he's discovering. Uh, in the 20 plus years that I've been excavating, I have found two pieces of gold, uh, very small, and they were simply this last summer. The first time I've ever found any gold at all in the excavation with which I was associated. So I don't get into this for the wealth issue at all, and I can assure you there isn't a whole lot of money to be earned in this. Uh, you need some other kind of job in order to accomplish it. Nor do I run into a lot of hazards. Uh, snakes occasionally appear on the site. Uh, we ad admonish everybody to leave them alone because uh, many of them are quite poisonous, but I've never gotten this close to any of them. Uh, of course, there is a glass panel between him and the cobra in this situation. Uh, we don't find much in the way of inscriptions. And in the 25 years that the renewed excavations of Bet Shemesh have been going on, they, we have found three inscriptions, all of them consisting of one word each. Uh, which really doesn't do a lot. And so we've had to wrestle with trying to figure out that. Fortunately, I had the privilege of publishing one of those one-word inscriptions that has just appeared in the excavation report. And then lastly, there isn't really a whole lot of danger. Uh, I don't have to run away from boulders rolling toward me, although uh, there are occasions when we do have to be very careful about boulders falling out of the bulk and off the sections. And one year, I remember, we had to stabilize the stone as I undercut it for it to fall onto the floor. But we were all watching very carefully. Uh, life in the archaeological world is generally not quite as exciting as is the case in Indiana Jones. It's probably a lot like a pilot. If you talk to a pilot, it's 98% you know, boredom and 2% sheer exhilaration. I'd like to think the proportions there are a little bit different. But I do want to talk about what is the value of archaeology, five uses of archaeology. I'm going to go through these rather quickly, uh, trying to give some examples of each of them. Listing them, there's first of all the apologetic. Now, I put this in quotes uh, because I did not get into archaeology in order to prove the Bible. But that, having said that, there are certainly are things that we will find from time to time that corroborate what is going on in the biblical text, and hence there is a value of this from the standpoint of anthropological, uh, cross-cultural studies, and sort of showing the commonness of humanity. Uh, there are also illustrative issues that come into play, uh, where a lot of times we're sort of at a loss as to what's going on in the biblical narrative, and archaeology gives us some insight. There, it, there's an exegetical value that occurs as well as a lexicographical value. And very briefly, I want to look at each of these in turn. Dealing with the apologetic one, uh, in apologetics, uh, my approach and most of the archaeologists with whom I work in this regard would look at it as a context of reality. The biblical narrative is not just some fictional story that's fabricated in the past, but it's rooted in historical reality. And there, while there are some things that we have not been able to corroborate from the standpoint of archaeology, uh, it is amazing how much of the biblical text is rooted in historical reality. This is as opposed to the other holy books of the ancient world, uh, with the exception, of course, the Hebrew Bible. And this context of reality sometimes takes some strange terms. Uh, I did not realize until actually preparing for this discussion today, so this is actually a brand new presentation all the way around, uh, but preparing for this discussion today, there are three coins that have been discovered that have the image of Salome on them. Uh, if you don't remember immediately your biblical narrative, Salome actually does not appear, or at least this one does not appear in the pages of the Bible, but she's alluded to. In the story where John the Baptist indicts Philip for having Herodias, his brother's wife, uh, Salome is the one that comes in and dances before Herod, and Herod says, uh, you know, what, ask whatever you want, up to half the kingdom. And of course, she goes to mom and asks, well, what should I give? And mom has this really 
a glorious view, have uh, one John the Baptist's head cut off on a platter. Now there's your nifty reward to uh, present to someone. And Salome, according to John the Baptist, is, or excuse me, according to Josephus, is the daughter of Herodias. And this coin is a portrayal of her in her latter years, the picture that you see on the right-hand side. Uh, she is about 50 years of age at this point, well past, I guess, the dance that she performed there uh, before Herod. But this, this tells us beyond simply reading the biblical narrative, or in this case Josephus, the reality of these individuals, they had an impact in the world in which they lived, and this becomes, of course, important. Another insight of apologetic value is, and confirmation for, of Scripture, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 22, there is a passing remark where Isaiah indicts the people for surveying the situation there in Jerusalem, and they break down some of the walls and build a fortification. Well, the picture that you're looking at actually shows some of the buildings that they tore down and the fortification wall that they built over it. And this is really a rather surprising kind of dovetail with what is a passing remark in the biblical narrative. And this can be used as sort of an apologetic element. There is a reality to this. There's a truthful, truthfulness to this. But do not approach archaeology from the standpoint of trying to prove everything that the Bible affirms because there are just things that are outside of the realm of possibility. <coughs> Miracles sort of by definition are outside of that realm. Then there is the aspect of anthropological concern and value. One of the things that I've discovered in this is that people are more alike through time than they are different. People are more alike across cultures than they are different. And these concerns are things that will occasionally emerge in our excavations. I'm going to give you some Greco-Roman kind of examples. The uh, clay vessel that you're looking at in the picture has down here at the very bottom a little spout, a little drain hole. Now this is actually from the Greek world, and there's a little hole up at the top that you can barely see. What they would do is in a political situation, they would fill this up with a plug at the bottom. They'd fill it up with water to where that hole is at the top. And then when a politician wants to give a speech, they pull the plug at the bottom. <laughs> and when the water runs out, the person has to shut up. Yeah. yeah. We need that in Congress, I think. <laughs> but uh, it shows certainly their concern about the need for succinctness in the argument and uh, a fairness of expression. And these are, of course, things that uh, we are concerned with. Now, this is an interesting little artifact from Greece. Uh, as you're looking at this, you may have no clue in the world what this is, but it's a potty chair, <laughs> dating from about the 5th century B.C. Things haven't changed a whole lot. In this case, the kid's sort of stuck in it and can't get out very well. Uh, but uh, this is from the excavations there in Greece. Then our medical procedures, they're really, really quite profound. This is a trephination procedure where they cut a section out of the skull of an individual. Uh, this is in the Museum of the Rockefeller, dating from about the 7th century B.C. And this individual didn't survive very long, uh, but many of them who underwent this procedure did, and this skull has grown back closed and so forth. But it raises a lot of the questions. One, why would you do this? Secondly, how did they do it? Thirdly, what did the people take in order to be drugged out and not have to suffer through the agony of this. And they did survive. Many of the people did survive. And so again, it shows that desire to hang on to life, uh, some invention of trying to address some of the problems that we have as human beings, and archaeology has given us some insight. And then there is the Swiss Army knife. When I saw this, I was just dumbfounded. This is in a, a museum in Cambridge. Uh, it comes from the 3rd century A.D., but if you look carefully, there is the iron blade, there's the spoon, there's the fork, there's the dental picks and all the other kind of stuff, all folds up into a nifty little pocket knife. And I thought, who are we to think we're so smart? I mean, these people in the ancient world had really sophisticated kind of stuff. Now, admittedly, they didn't have electricity and some of the things that we have to facilitate our activity. But uh, the ingeniousness of these people shows that there is a commonality to an extent of humanity across the board. And I would look at this as a, as a response many times that people make to, well, this Bible is 2,000 plus years old, it's so out of date, and we've advanced so far beyond this. But when we actually begin looking at the concerns of human beings, 
Those concerns basically are the same, and we basically change the technical ways we do stuff, when in reality what drives us as human beings are issues from the heart. And those are concerns that God is addressing, and the technical ways are just sort of the secondary concerns that come into the picture. Then there are the illustrative elements that are very, very valuable as we look at all of this. One of those would be the only piece of crucifixion that has ever been found at all. Out of all of the thousands of, ex uh, of crucifixions that the Romans perpetrated on humanity, this is the only example that's ever been found. Now, as you're looking at this, you may not have a clue as to what part of the body this is. But it's actually a nail that goes through the heel of the individual in which then their person is straddling the central post and the nail is driven through the heel bone into the post. And this is sort of, I, I, I'm not going to argue this is exactly the way Jesus was crucified. Josephus indicates that the Romans were so uh, adept at doing this kind of thing, they got bored with it and it became somewhat creative in how they would attach a person to a cross. But nonetheless, this is a very sobering kind of realization. And this artifact is in the uh, Israel Museum. And it, it, you stand there and look at this and think, wow. Jesus went through something like that for me and for you. And it should give us pause as we evaluate the narrative a little more carefully. There is, of course, an exegetical value that comes into play where it gives us some clarification of discussion. During the first century B.C. and A.D., the uh, Jewish world devised these vessels that were made out of chalk, and they have these shaved surfaces such as we have here. Now, Mark will refer to the fact that the Jews, and he's writing, of course, to a Gentile audience, uh, apparently, and he talks about uh, the Jews have this tendency to wash cups and all of this kind of thing. And it appears that the reason these chalk cups were made was because, according to Leviticus, if something unclean falls into a vessel that is made of ceramic, it's supposed to be busted. But it doesn't say anything about stone. And so that was the legal loophole out of the system. If there are stone vessels and it becomes unclean, all you have to do is wash it and then everything is hunky-dory fine. And on a certain level, this helps us better appreciate sort of the mindset of the Pharisees as well. Now, Jesus doesn't indict this kind of thing, but nonetheless, uh, it helps us better appreciate some of the issues going on. And then there are the lexicographical issues. Whenever... For a long time, the New Testament was thought to be sort of a Holy Ghost language, a special kind of Greek that God used to communicate with humanity. But with the discovery of papyrus and parchment manuscripts, particularly and primarily out of Egypt because of the dry atmosphere, the scholarly world became aware of the fact that this language that is characteristic of the New Testament was sort of the common language of everybody. Occasionally, scholars will refer to this as gutter language. I, I, that's a gross overstatement. It wasn't gutter language. It was just sort of the language of the common person. And because of that insight, we were able to come to a realization that God is in reality communicating His will to humanity through a medium that He wants the common person to understand it. And I think that is a very, very important implication. And these are some of the reasons that uh, how archaeology can be used, but in all honesty, I have to say one of the big reasons is just fun, at least if you like doing this kind of thing. I find it exhilarating to be one of the first individuals to look at and touch an artifact that has been buried for 2,300 years or longer. And in this case, uh, Dr. Wheeler has some examples of mud brick from this collection in his office. But here I am tracing my fingers across the fingers of a person who made this mud brick in 1300 BC. And it's, it's just exhilarating. It's sort of like reaching across time and shaking hands with somebody so long ago. And this is a lot of the thrill that I have whenever it comes to this. Now, I use all of this, of course, in my biblical studies and in my teaching, and I hope that you will learn to appreciate it as well. Thank you very much.